such a crowded room of uh, smiling faces tonight, and I know it's always quite a journey to uh, make your make your way up here at the end of a long day. So we really appreciate all your work. Um, tonight we actually have a special, uh, as you know, a special opportunity to hear from uh, two really unique individuals, and we're really excited about that. You're actually sitting in, uh, this date was originally uh, designed for our family ambassador workshop that we hold um, six sessions to teach our families um, advocacy and uh, more about Tierra del Sol and how they can take that kind of information into the community. So. If you like what you hear tonight, we encourage you to come back to our Family Ambassador Workshop where um, it's a great way of meeting families who have been here for a long time as well as new families who are starting their journey here at Tierra. And uh, we'd love to have you um, come back and join us. And so can the folks who are in the Family Ambassador Workshop right now, can you just raise your hand so that Okay, so if you want to come back, uh, we have four more events after this, not as large as this one tonight, but for those uh, who rose, rose their hand, if you want to see them or see me afterwards about that, um, that Family Ambassador Workshop, please please do so. Again, I encourage you to do that. So um, I tonight you're going to hear from uh, Valerie Bannerman, um, and, uh, who is highly recognized in the field. Uh, Valerie actually um, started... Uh, with Steve a long time ago um, and uh, in really helping us in kind of our council on advocacy for our families. Um, we, it's always an interesting journey uh, when, we, when we work with folks, everyone's journey is a little bit different and their needs and their desires uh, for their life is different and, and uh, oftentimes that creates a need to advocate better um, both at the regional center le level as well as uh, legally and, and legislatively. And so um, Valerie's been very um, active with our organization for 25 years or so now. She believes in us and in our mission. Uh, she's uh, personally connected to our organization and, and supports us in a variety of ways. So we're uh, pleased and honored to have you here tonight. Um, additionally, uh, we get to hear from our very own uh, Steve Miller. Um, and uh, so this is kind of a bit of our shift and change uh, along the next uh, few months. Uh, and. Uh, Steve will continue his journey with Tira in very much this way. Uh, his uh, breadth of experience has not just been in, in leading this organization, but in an advocacy role for our families, um, both on a state and local level. And so it's very exciting to be able to have him here um, as an expert in advocacy as well. Um, they're going to, um, just to kind of give you a little sense of what's going to happen tonight, they're going to give us some kind of broad strokes of the state and um, kind of how the system is now, the Department of Developmental Services and how we see the system, um, and maybe some changes that we've seen in the last 10 years or so, um, as well as broad strokes on Tira's philosophy about advocacy and kind of who we are as an organization, our history um, of parents very much like you sitting in our rooms helping to create who we are today through advocacy and, and your desire to see something different or better for your sons and daughters. And then we're also going to go into a little bit more specifics about um, some things that you can look for both in your IPP process as well as just kind of some um, specifics that you can look for in advocating for your uh, sons and daughters kind of through your journey um, in the state. Um, and the last thing I like to say is this is really an interactive process. This is an evening for you as is it much as is an evening to hear um, information being given to you. So if you have questions, if the information that's being given to you uh, uh, creates a question in your mind, I really, um, I really want to hear from you tonight. We really want to have this be an, uh, an interactive process. So we'll try to encourage as many questions as we can or, or stop what we're saying for a second. And, and if it's a good moment to pause, we can take your question at the time. So does that sound like a good, good thing? Okay, so we'll get started. Here you go. Um, I've um, been around um, <laughs> uh, one way and another this stuff for a lot of years. Um, I have senior status, as they say, right? Um, let me tell you that um, 
I am as concerned about the future of services for individuals in the state of California who have special needs as I have ever been uh, in the 40-some years that I've been doing this. Uh, and that's really for three reasons. One, we were terribly, terribly and grossly impacted by the recession and the state budget crisis. <clears throat> it was an opportunity for those who would like to not see us exist in a whole variety of ways uh, to use an excuse of a very real economic crisis to begin to knock away at it. Two, we don't live in a time in which having just, if you believe the news, come out of an economic crisis situation People are still afraid to care for those least able to care for themselves. And three, there's just not a whole lot of sympathy out there for the populations that we serve or represent. We've been very lucky in the state of California through the efforts of some folks who are some in this room, I think, and some others who are not in this room. Frank Lannerman was encouraged to pass the Lannerman Act. Um, Unlike um, other states in California, everyone is entitled, quote unquote entitled, to at least have access to an IPP, an individual program plan, and access to services. If you lived in Ohio, if you lived in um, Alabama, if you lived in Arizona or Nevada, and you had an adult family member with a developmental disability and or special needs, you would be in a waiting situation. One does not get in to program opportunities in those states until somebody else leaves. It is a capped population. Given the rise in autism across the country uh, and surely in the state of California, that would have been devastating uh, if we were in that situation. Yet I suspect that there are some within the state of California who if they could totally undercut Landerman and go back to that waiting room uh, philosophy would like to see us go there. At least it would appear so from what's been taking place over the last five years. Although the Lanterman Act in its broadest terms continues to exist, the limitations, the cuts, the way it's being interpreted is as restrictive and difficult to access as I have ever seen it. It is virtually impossible, virtually impossible <laughs> for an adult individual with developmental disabilities to get the kind of full programming that even six years ago we were able to get. You know, I was, in, you, you won't believe it by looking at me, but as short a time ago as four years ago, I was at 12,000, 13,000 feet in the Himalayas in Nepal. And I was exhausted after one long day, and I found myself sitting on the grass outside of one of the coffee, quote unquote, coffee houses. And two young kids came up and said to me, oh my goodness, my mother would never have done something like this. And I said, yes, well, let's get over that part about how old I am. And let me talk to you about who you are and why you happen to be here. They were both graduates from prestigious universities in the United States, neither of whom could find jobs, and so they'd gone to volunteer at a, an orphanage in Nepal uh, until things got better back in the States. So they got to quizzing me about what I did with my life and who I was and how I'd done it, and we got to talking about deinstitutionalization, which was a thing that I was very involved in in the late 60s. And they said to me the following sentence, and how did that all turn out for you? And it's a very interesting question, how did it turn out? We thought we were doing great stuff, where some folks thought they were doing great stuff, for example, when we pushed to get insurance to cover behavioral services for autism. It's actually turned out to be a nightmare in a thousand different ways and has decreased the services that families are receiving in a very effective way. 
and put financial burden back on families. Each time that begins to happen, the structure of our overall state system, that is the ability of everybody, based upon their, their programmatic needs, to access quality services is eroded just a little bit. And so we have to think about, it seems to me, in, at least in this decade, the question of how is that going to turn out? Because we have to think about the value that we know can exist when you have a rate-stabilized system of effective services throughout the population for individuals who have those needs and that families can't possibly, unless they are just enormously wealthy, cannot possibly provide on their own. You cannot, for example, no matter how wealthy you may be, put together a social club or a social group activity with a group of similarly situated individuals easily unless you hire a staff of community organizers and social workers who are going to go out and put it together and then you're in effect running a day social services program uh, and that's not cheap uh, and most people can't afford to do that it is a time in california where it is vitally important for those who care about the populations that we serve and or represent to be incredibly knowledgeable about everything that is being taken away and organized, organized in a way that goes back to staying to the state legislatures. You know, we do vote. Our family members vote. And many families have siblings of individuals who are disabled who are certainly voting. It's not, it's not age specific. It's, you know, we're talking everything from 18 through, um, through quite elderly ages of a whole family, each of whom is going to vote. And that we need to be aware of and be on top of where these changes are happening. At the same time, at the same time, the other thing I've become an advocate of is what is commonly referred to, at least by the city of Los Angeles, when it's giving away our parkland. That's a whole other um, trip that I'm on. Um, Public-private partnership. An organization such as this one, for example, an organization that is going to be effective given how hard we're going to have to work to keep rate stabilization and other things in place, cannot ultimately survive unless there is a private partnership component of it, which is adequately, and even more than, adequately funded that provides an endowment, that provides a place in which there is security to try and expand the program and do the program. It's pretty clear to me as I've watched what's the deterioration, and it's nothing but deterioration of programs over the last seven years, that without the only ones that are making it are the ones that are in fact got this private public partnership pretty much in place and working. So I think it's a twofold job that those of us who care really are taking on as we go into this decade, in the middle of this decade. And that's fighting as much as we can to protect the rights that are there. But secondly, recognizing that we have to have an expansive view of how do you make this work and that you can't rely just on the public dollar. You have to be looking at programs that are multifaceted in terms of where they're coming from. I have probably done, I've always done regional center work, but because there is no provision in the Lanterman Act for uh, attorney's fees if families prevail, it's often been cheaper for the families just to pay for the service than to hire the lawyer. That's no longer the truth anymore because there are very expensive services that some families need and it's cheaper to hire the lawyer. Up until six or seven years ago, it was sure better than in a lot of places. <laughs> and we saw folks getting services and getting out and doing stuff. Uh, there's been a steady deterioration. At the very moment in time, at the very moment in time when the most sophisticated graduates of our public school system that we've ever had are coming out. 
because as bad as special education is, the kids we're putting out now, in fact, have skills and are further along than the same age kids that we would have put out 10 or 15 years ago. And at the very moment that they're coming out, ready to move into really exciting, innovative stuff, it's all being contracted. So I urge you to uh, take advantage of every opportunity you have to learn how to be effective advocates. We're going to talk about that a little tonight. Uh, but to keep a keen eye on, get on a mailing list, join a parent group, get on something that's keeping you informed of what's going on. Is that what I was supposed to do? Yeah, uh, no one tells Valerie what to say. Yeah. I always have to check with Steve. I'm never quite sure. I had a very bad day, by the way, with LA Unified. So a yeah. little bit of the cynicism yeah. today. I felt like my head is banged against the wall one too many times. Well, let's let's see if we can um, encourage Valerie about the future. Um, most of the folks in this room, uh, first of all, how's the temperature in this room? Is it a Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see if we can give Val uh, a little hope for the future. M most of the folks in this room um, have have uh, found found Tierra for their um, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, and their and their loved ones. Um, Tierra's. Tierra is that organization that Valerie just described, really. We're the organization that has advocated for and fought for the future of your sons and daughters. Um, when you think about the range of programs from our Nexus uh, program that supports these young people to come out of high school and go directly to college, um, from the programs that serve the folks that are aging. You know, we, we see a lot of people now, we serve a lot of people, and we have for uh, 30 plus years. And as people are going through the later life stages, um, they need specialized care and, and uh, attention as well. Uh, for people that are in their 30s and 40s, every single human being is on a journey through life from birth um, through the end of their days. And what we know is, underneath this whole notion of disability or, or differences, we all are the same. And we will all go through these passages. And this is an organization that has committed itself to stand with you and to stand with your children as partners and supports through that entire life journey. Now, the fact of the matter is Valerie's absolutely right. Um, California, uh, California um, uh, speaks out of both sides of its mouth eloquently. The Lanterman Act describes and promises to your sons and daughters a full and complete entitlement to services. That is the law. Every year, the state administration, the governor's office, and the legislature uh, funds a finite amount of dollars. They have determined over the last 10 years, and it doesn't matter whether there's a Republican in office or a Democrat in office, they have determined that they have made too great of an expenditure on uh, people with developmental disabilities. And so they have systematically begun to cut back on those allocations. They have not, in fact, changed much of the language of the Lanterman Act. So they have essentially cre uh, created a collision course between the resources that the state makes available and the promise that they make um, to the families. And you do see uh, in the decisions that Regional Center makes uh, the dilemma that they're in when these are mostly very good, all of them. Nobody got into the field of, of uh, social services and human services to say no or be bad people. Um, that's what he says. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I know, and I know them. I, my, some of my very best friends have created, have dedicated their life to, to service through service at regional centers and school districts and um, in, in the administrative roles. 
But when they come to a meeting and on the one side they're looking at a budget that says, um, I've got to make it through the end of the year, and on the other side, here are 12 families with legitimate needs and the arithmetic doesn't add up, the state budget has put those professionals on that collision course. And I have seen so much anguish in those types of, um, those types of interactions. So Tierra has decided to attack this. We essentially outperform the state. We have decided that we won't let the state budget dictate the future for your sons and daughters. That their future needs to really be determined by their willingness, motivation, character, and ambition to do all that they can with their own lives, and their families and their supporters' willingness to engage and help them achieve all that they can in their lives. And as an organization of, uh, of families, parents, friends, uh, we take every nickel we can get, and believe me, we're very good at going to the regional center and fighting for every penny we can. Um, and then we also go out into the community and we go to foundations, we have golf tournaments, um, we come to each of you and we say, in order for us to deliver on your son or daughter's life potential, we need your help too. And collectively, we will find the resources that we need to give your son and daughter a chance to do all that they are capable of doing in their life. That's our, that's our commitment. And we will never back away from that commitment. Um, there, we're gonna begin a two-year process of fighting the legislature and through our Family and Ambassador Workshop Program, and everybody in this room, by the way, by showing up here tonight, you're deputized into our, uh, our political action efforts that are, that are just coming underway. And by the time that we're done, there will not be a legislator in the state of California that doesn't understand their responsibility under the Lanterman Act and their power to act through their role as state legislators. Um, and I do believe that two years of very strong and active advocacy that we will all be involved in will sway enough votes to see a change in, to see a change in our structure. Ultimately, our future depends on that. The rates that we get now, and I don't want to bore you, were really created on a model in the 1990s when minimum wage was either 335 or maybe four and a quarter, and a gallon of gas was a uh, $1.15, and a loaf of bread was whatever that was. So the, the arithmetic of the state's reimbursement uh, model is frankly impossible to continue. And so we will politically have to uh, have the will and the power to have uh, the state recognize that and change the reimbursement model um, uh, soon. Um, with that said, I, I, w I do want to segue into what, what we can talk to you about now um, for your sons and daughters and how you can best plan um, for the future. So the first thing I, I want to do is, is I want to say, and I, and, I, and I wear this tie whenever I'm going to talk to parents, it's my daughter's uh, alma mater, UC Davis, and it, it helps ground me in the fact that um, we believe that there are really no fundamental differences in what a, what a quality of life looks like and feels like for somebody with a developmental disability and what quality of life looks like and feels like for someone without a developmental disability. And that ultimately, as parents, what you, uh, what you hope for and wish for and will work for for your children is the same kind of life for your disabled child as you want for your non-disabled child. And that is a, a life with meaning and purpose, a life that has something that, that, that in fact is meaningful and dignified work and work can either be at $20 an hour or work can be in a volunteer capacity if that is important not only to the individual but is a true contribution to the, to the community. Um, and that work is the nexus through which we meet other people who have similar interests and create truly important and mutually valued relationships. 
And so the essence of, of what you want for all your children is for them to be uh, respected and loved by other people, for them to have a sense of purpose in their life, for, for, for all of your children, disabled or not, um, to, uh, to have a, a sense that their life is on some kind of a path or course that works and that ultimately when they come to the uh, latter end of their life, that they have lived a life full and worth living. Isn't that what we want for all of our kids? So how do we, the difference is maybe, um, the, the, the kind of intentionality, the, t the kind of additional focus that we have to bring so that our kids with special needs can go through all of the typical life passages from uh, youth through early adulthood, through middle age, and then to the, uh, the latter years of their life. Um, I do, again, I look at my tie and I think my daughter's 30 and I was on the internet all morning trying to find a damn job for her because she's going to get married soon and she may wind up living on the East Coast and I don't want her on the East Coast. So I'm going through everybody I know thinking if I can find her a good job and her husband is willing to travel, maybe they'll live on the West Coast and we can see our grandchildren every once in a while. So I will stay active in my kids' life as long as they're alive, right? Okay. So. When you, have a, when, you, when you have a kid with special needs, I think we just need to be more intentional and more focused and a little more active in, in rallying people around and, and you're, you're, more, you're more engaged engineers in making, in making things work. But ultimately you're trying to help that person go through the same uh, 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 life passages. And if you went back, if I could interrupt you, if you went back and looked at some of the original legislative history on the Lanterman Act, the words that Steve is using are the words that accompanied that when they talked about having an individual program plan. And what some very enlightened people at the time were saying is that for many of our sons and daughters, we don't have to sit down and write out a plan, although some of them still require it even though but in any case, for many of our sons and daughters, we should not have to sit down and write out a specific plan. But for some of our sons and daughters, indeed, we have to have an intentional plan. And the notion of the individual program plan, which has become this document that floats out there that people sign without reading, unfortunately. Yeah, in fact, let me re ask a question. Those of you that have uh, a child with a, who is a regional center client, Raise your hand if you have carefully read the, your child's IPP in the last six months. Wow. That's, That's great. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, because Thank many you. people sign that page that they used to bring in even before they wrote it and handed it to you and say, just sign this, you know, and yeah. then we'll attach it at the end. I think we put a stop to that somewhere along the way. But nonetheless, it is still a document that is far from what it should be. Far from what it should be. And it's a crucial part of the program planning that Steve's talking about. So let's, let's, think, about the, let's think about the central role of the IPP. And then let's think about kind of the typical, uh, you know, that, the, the book uh, passages. You know, uh, everybody is going through various life passages. Let's, let's think about the typical stages of life for, for adults. Uh, for an adult in their 20s, you know, what are the things that, what are the, what's life like for people that are, that are going through the 20s? They're, they're young and they're immortal and uh, it's all about exploration. It's all about getting more independence from mom and dad. Maybe they have a job but it may not be the career path they're going to be on. Um, they've got the keys to the car. They're meeting new people. Maybe they've left their childhood friends behind. They're, it's, it's exploration and discovery and, and, and dabbling at jobs and things. So what would an IPP look like that was supporting your child with, uh, with, with special needs if it was really focused on that stage of life? 
What things would you be wanting to help your son or daughter get support with if they're in their early um, to mid 20s? You get to answer. Yeah. <laughs> what comes to mind? Friends. Okay. Adult friends, social relationships. Um, hopefully, social relationships with people that uh, that they have things in common with. So, how do people with who are coming out of uh, high school or, or early adults, how do they begin to discover what their interests are, what their passions in life might be? How do they begin to dabble? How do they begin to know what kind of job they might have an, an ability for if they've never been exposed to very many things? So, what are you going to want? the focus of services and supports to be for, for a young adult. Career goals. So, say that again? Career goals. Career goals. So offer them options to find out what they want to do. As many different opportunities to explore a bigger life so they can begin to pick and choose the things that have meaning and value for them. So when you shop around for a program, and again, since most of you found your way here, hopefully we're, we're doing pretty well with that. Um, but even if your son or daughter is here, and I, and I spoke to our program directors before tonight, because I didn't want to sick you all on them, uh, if they didn't really, you know, if they were nervous about that. The program directors here very much want to know what you know about your sons and daughters' interests, uh, hobbies, passions. If you have not shared those things with your current um, program staff, let them know because they will do their best to incorporate some of those things into um, their, their routines. And let me just suggest to you that, you know, you go through various regional centers have various forms of the IPP, although there's supposed to be statewide standardization coming. Um, but you go through those various categories, right? So you go through the category that says community interests. Sally likes to bowl. Family will make every effort to give Sally bowling experience. Don't be signing that document. Don't be signing that document. You are entitled to begin to write into those IEPPs. You're going to make the regional center people crazy when you start to do this, but you are entitled to be writing into those IEPs, IPPs, exactly the kind of stuff that Steve is talking about. Sally has not yet determined her major recreational interest and needs to be exposed to a number of recreational opportunities and requires the support of a recreational therapist to help her explore those in various organized group contexts. <laughs> well, yeah, yes and no. Wait a minute. I, I, while, I, while I agree with my good friend and colleague from the great state of Ohio, tell you why he doesn't. Yeah. Um, we, we also believe that as parents and, and the natural support system, that not everything that, uh, that your son and daughter needs ought to be provided by professional um, support. That if that you, what I say no, I'm, right? I'm, no, I'm just, I'm, if, you're, if you, if you um, belong to a community of faith, if you have uh, uh, ethnic cultural uh, ac values and, and activities, uh, if you have passions in music or whatever they are, find every conceivable way to incorporate your son and daughter into the, into the activities, routines, uh, rituals, celebrations, and ceremonies that make up meaningful life within your family and, and your social circles. But and if you need help, <laughs> and, if you, and if you need help to accomplish that, then you should do exactly what my good friend and mentor Valerie Vanneman says and make sure that you ask for and include the, sp the specific supports, services that will give you the opportunity to incorporate your sons and daughters into a meaningful life. Let me just tell you that this is a work in progress um, a little bit about this 
going after the IPP kind of thing, um, because it really does need to be rethought. Uh, and, you know, Disability Rights California puts out a wonderful publication, but it may be a little bit old hat in terms of where we are right now, and it may be time to rethink it. So a little bit of what you're hearing here is rethinking. You're, you can say you were there when you saw the rethinking uh, taking place. Because, in fact, it's not exactly, it seems to me, what Steve says. It has to be a combination so that these IPP documents actually become relatively lengthy documents. And if you don't fit in their little space, well, you know, they're going to have to make more space. They're going to have to add on to it. So that you might, just to take this recreational activity thing, have it go on to say, the family is actively involved in A, B, C, and D. At this point in time, the family needs no supports with regard to having Sally continue with those activities. However, <laughs> however, if there is a difficulty, That's they're right. going to need the support of a X, Y, or Z. Yeah. But beyond that, that activity, however, is not sufficient to meet Sally's needs and interest in here. So Sally needs to have access to, and you know, we get into this, and I don't, I love Tierra del Sol. I wouldn't be here, uh -oh. I wouldn't have spent the years with him if I weren't. However, <laughs> not every place is always everything to everybody. Right. And so it may well be that you would say that, you know, we used to have these wonderful Saturday programs that were run by people who were not associated with the other day programs. There's a whole other population of folks to uh, be with and incorporate with. So we need to go back to saying, look, you want to talk about program development? We need to go back to developing some Saturday programs that are purely recreational in nature and run by different things so that this IPP would say, Sally can, in fact, three times a month participate in X, and we're going to support that, and we're going to support this. We just have to really be thinking. Now, of course, they're going to say, well, we don't fund that. We don't have the resources for that. Well. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, because I don't know, have you ever seen a regional center list all the things that it actually does fund? No, of course not. Because if you knew that, you might ask for it. Um, so the fact is that we need to actually be pushing what's in these documents in ways, and this recreational is just one of them. It also gives those agencies that are out there, and particularly agencies like Tierra del Sol, <laughs> an opportunity when they see IEPs, IPPs that have that in there to begin to talk about, you know, we really need to do another adjunct thing and you're going to really have to fund us to do another program of this sort or that sort. The IPP document language is as significant today as anything you undertake. Each and every piece of it, each and every piece of it, each and every piece of it. Talk to you about the medical stuff for a moment. Sally receives Medi-Cal and her parents will continue to make sure that she gets good medical service. That's what your normal IPP says, right? What does that mean? What does that mean? Do you know what that means? I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. In fact, the regional center system is one that is supposed to provide when, in fact, the provision needs to be made. So it may well be that the, this IPP needs to say the basic insurance for which Sally is eligible is Medi-Cal. However, if Sally is working, and you have to look back, and is Sally going to start working someplace? Where are the other things that come together? The regional center will assist in exploring other insurance options. The regional center will do X, Y, or Z. The regional center will vendor a health care monitor for Sally. Perhaps the family no longer has the ability. Perhaps, let's take an extreme example, pui, 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 knock on wood, Mother's dead, father, and a, and a young adult woman who's going through menopause. 
you know, that dad shouldn't be actually having to go through that with that young lady and be the one who's monitoring that medical service. Somebody ought to be doing it, and we ought to be writing in there what needs to be done. Everybody's individual. You've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. Everybody is individual. And it's going to vary from person to person, family situation to family situation. But whatever it is, We've got to think. We have got to start thinking more creatively about how we're writing them and what's in there. We, complete, we completely agree with that. And we do have to recognize that people are moving through life and change is the only constant in life. As people move through their 20s and into their 30s, uh, typically people in their 30s um, have begun to establish where they're going to live and with whom they're going to live and what their life style and life quality is going to be about. What, what kinds of things would you want to have in an IPP for somebody in their 20s or 30s so that they're beginning to build the skills, build the understanding, and growing towards the kind of living and life circumstances that, that makes sense and, and feel right for them. Um, again, while they're still living at home, you don't necessarily need a professional for you to realize that maybe they can take on more responsibilities. They can be more active now adult contributors to the household. Uh, chores, uh, but meaningful, important adult chores. Taking some of the load off of you guys. That's important not just for the moment, for their dignity and their relationship with you, but every single uh, activity that they begin to recognize and assume as an adult living responsibility is one piece that they that won't be foreign to them when they begin the process of moving out of their um, parents home and into whatever their next living arrangement will be um, trust me being safe in the community is going to be uh, it's going to be every parent's biggest worry uh, for the entire life of their children disability or not so everything that we can do to teach, empower, expose in a controlled but in a, but in a growth promoting way, um, whether it's utilization of public transportation, feeling like they can have a key to the front door because they can be safe at home and they won't let somebody in, they won't buy a million magazine subscriptions. Anything that, that you can do that is part of the natural growth, you should do. And when it, it ought to be written into the idea and, that that's what's happening. And in yeah, fact, when you. I agree. And so when you look at what, what should be included in an IPP for, for somebody who's now in their 30s, if they do not have a meaningful uh, work as a centerpiece of, of their uh, daytime life, then they're not keeping up with where they should be with a natural lifespan. And again, that meaningful work could be 40 hours a week for $20 an hour with a 401k, or it might be uh, four days a week, they, they're really depended upon at the Pet Orphans Society because that, uh, that uh, uh, pet shelter really could not meet the needs of all those, um, you know, abused and abandoned pets. Or at MEND, they're not just there on the periphery, but they're a core member of the work family that runs a place like MEND. That is also meaningful and important work. But if you know that your kid is not, is still, uh, going to the mall and, and or doing whatever and they don't have anchors that are meaningful in their lives Then that IPP should really say whatever's I need a change and the and what we and I would suggest that this is a work in progress and Between the advocacy community and the service delivery community We should be writing in outcomes not access to services. Right. We don't win by gaining the most hours of service we win when an IPP says, by the end of next year, my son or daughter will be doing the following things, and you are holding us accountable. And by the way, we're holding you accountable for your responsibilities in this, and the system and people like Valerie are holding us all accountable. And you know, that commercial that's on now where the guy who's got I did some car commercial um, that I happen to see late at night, they must run it 24 hours a day, where the guy's got his daughter changing the tire. Yeah. I, and I, every time I see it, I think, you know, we ought to take that clip 
and just run it for everybody in terms of, here's what we're talking about. This father had a notion. He wanted his daughter to be able to change the tire. That's what these are about. What's the outcome we're looking for? We want Sally to be able to go to the bowling alley, join a group of people, be comfortable in there, and manage it herself. Uh, and to do it without having to have adult supervision uh, any more than is necessary to do it out. But that's what we're looking for. And that's what these IPPs need to be saying, because that's what we need to be thinking about in terms of doing it, rather than just the stuff we're writing now. Yes. I, I'm uh, working uh, now, I mean, in, I don't know if it makes any difference, but I live in, the San, in San Diego, and I work in San Diego, and I actually have just been invited to be at the Regional Center Advocacy Program. So I want to start this with my, I'm very, very excited. But about the work, uh, the place I, I work, they have the working, but they work it's pretty. I mean, it's a wonderful thing, and they make money, and, and you see, see them sitting, doing this. I would like to see them have choices and, and develop more the inner person so they can choose what they want to do Thank for you. work. So I, I do, in fact, th that's a really important point, and one that we probably haven't emphasized enough yet tonight. The major revolution, I think, in our, in our field in the last 10 or 15 years is a recognition that we need to be following the hopes and, and validating the hopes and desires of the individuals we serve, and that professionals do not know best. There is not yet an aptitude test that will determine what somebody's passions are and what they would excel in. And, and as parents, we, we have to realize that just like we had to let go a little bit of, what, of how we wanted to control our non-disabled children's lives, we do want to give our disabled children the respect and the space for them to say yes and say no and to make efforts and fail and get up on their feet again and try something different. And I would say this process of discovery and exploration is something that, that Tierra has, um, uh, has, has learned so much about in the last 10 years. And as a result of, of not trying to necessarily guide and direct, but stand alongside of people while they experiment at college or in a variety of different things, we have found that people who would never have been accepted in a work program, who would have been bounced out of uh, other behavioral programs, can somehow find their way into a set of routines and experiences that work, feel good in their own skin. And, and, and they can succeed. And we can work with them not as their trainers, but as their coaches and mentors, helping them achieve what they've discovered to be their interest and passion. This is still a work in progress for people who have been uh, given the reputation as severely disabled, um, profoundly, whatever, whatever these words are that mean they don't know what they're doing and we have to guide their life. In fact, that's really not true. We just need to be much better listeners and facilitators and, emp and em empowerers. It's not a perfect science. Um, but when I think about the Leilani's and the Teresa's and the Verettas and the Gabby's and the various program directors here, they have been willing to let our clients essentially drive our programs in so many different directions. And as a result, um, People are getting A's in college. People are, uh, you know, working and earning wages. People are out doing things that, that we never would have dreamed of, and we didn't tell them what to do. They, they told us what to do. So how do we get on an IPP, and how do we as families and support people um, ensure that their voices are being listened to and, and they, have, they continue to have opportunities to grow and learn even into their 40s and 50s. And I'm seeing Shirley Seidel uh, out there, who's been uh, a member of the Tierra family forever. And your daughter, I, I've learned a few things. Her daughter has you know, very limited speech and would be not, con you know, who would be considered on the end of needing the most intensive services and supports. And um, one day in the middle of, of, uh, uh, of 
nothing exceptional. She heard a piano in a room, and I had never really heard her speak a word that I could un interpret. She just stands up, clear as a day, points and says, piano. And a smile came on her face. And, and, and I learned she loves music. And I think I also learned at a later date that she, uh, when she's home with you, she uh, likes a bath and maybe listening to classical music. Think about, think about a, a, a lady in her 40s or 50s who uh, lives in a, a, you know, a congregate arrangement and whose life is programmed. Think about yourself, a hard week, and it's now Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, and you get to climb into a warm bubble bath and listen to classical music. Doesn't that just feel good? Don't we want everybody to have some things in their life that are just theirs like that? Somehow we do have to get even better at listening and understanding. And if you know those things about your kids and you haven't shared them with your program people, those don't need to be in IPPs. I know Gabby, I know Leilani, I know all the programs. They want to know those things so we can incorporate them into the daily routine. And we want to share those things that we've learned. And so collectively, life starts to feel right for people, whether they're in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 70s. And I guess I do think I think to the extent that you could get it written into IPP documents, we ought to really try and start to write them into IPP documents. Because caseworkers change, you know, caseworkers are a dime a year, um, and you, you may go through three or four of them in any given period of time. Um, and have you ever sat down, as I've recently had occasion to do, if you really want to really make yourself a little bit crazy, um, like ask to sit down and read your child's case record in the regional center from beginning to end. And you know how they do it in the regional centers. It starts at the back and it just keeps going forward. So you, you always are starting down here and then you have to go to the next page. And it's hard to read. I mean, it's, it's actually set up to be difficult to read, I think. Um, I recently had occasion to read an individual who is now 34 years old. Uh, has been a client of the regional center since birth. Um, all of the entries that have been made in the intervening 34 years. And I, you know the one thing I came away from after I was done with it? I don't know who this person is from those records. That's true. I know what they think about the parents. <laughs> I know what various regional center people have thought about the parents over time. I know what the parent has thought about the regional center people from time to time, at least based on the reported phone calls and in later days faxes and now emails. Um, but I don't know a thing. I do not know a thing. If this person walked into a room and I wanted to try and have a conversation with them about something that they cared about, I would not know from reading those hundreds of pages of regional center entries who this individual was. Now, you know, I did not read all the IPPs. I only read, because I was looking for something particular, obviously, but I, I only read all the, the case entries. But what do they call them? Case notes, whatever they call them. Um, what are they? ID notes, thank you. Um, I have a Freudian block about them at the moment. Um, but. I think that we need to make sure that it's somewhere there is a record of who this person is, and the way we have access to do that is the IPP. I, I agree. So I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing that we're going to be, we're coming close to the end of our time. Yes. I, I just have a problem with that. It's just it, all these problems. I have a more severely um, involved stuff. My son is severely involved handicap, and so then you put it in the IPP. And everything that you wanted is there, but yet, when the time you implement, you will be told that there's not enough funding. With it. So you come to the facility and you sign it in, and then, well, you know, this is what we demand for him, just the, even just the basic needs. And you'll be told, we do not have enough staff. Let me, let me talk we to you about this. We do not have staffing to, to, right. uh, well, let me talk to you about this. Attend to these needs. There, there's two parts to that problem. Problem number one is I have identified it 
is the regional, in order to file for an administrative hearing against a regional center, they have to send you a rejection letter. The law is set up in this very peculiar way that you can't just sort of sui generis file. There, you have to have made it, ask for a request, and they said no. So I've been trying to figure out, in, in my, I have dream, I, 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 I am a product of the 60s. So I <laughs> periodically have dreams of, you know, bringing institutions down and rebuilding them. I can't help it. Um, how did that all turn out would not Maybe be the question. Yeah, yeah, I probably, <laughs> probably did. <laughs> if I remember. My hair was a lot longer. If I had mine too. <laughs> um, but in any case, and then a lot fewer pounds. Um, the, uh, but the jewelry and the long skirts were great. <laughs> the, um, the fact is that if you say, I want this written in the IPP, and they say, well, we're not going to do it. Theoretically, to appeal that, they have to send you a notice that they're not going to do it and give you an appeal form. But it's not actually the case. I think, in fact, if you ask to have things written in and they just don't do it, you have a right. The forms are on the Office of Administrative Hearings, a DDS portion of it. There is a, an appeal form there. You can file it. There's nothing that precludes you from doing it, saying that they have refused to develop an IPP that contains all the things that I want to have in it. Now, I know of no reported cases as of this moment in time when I'm saying that where this has been done, because it's something I've, we're just beginning to talk about doing it. The second part of this is, oh, that's all great, but we don't fund that. Well, the Act still does say that if, in fact, there's no other way to get an outcome from an IPP, they have to find a way. So that again, I think you want to say to them, please put in writing that this outcome that I'm looking for for Sally, which is, for one of a better example, that she's going to learn to change a tire. At the end of the year, I want her to be able to change a tire, which is not realistic. But I'm, it's back to my commercial, right, that's running in my head. And they say, well, we don't do that. Say, so please put that in writing to me for me, and then I think that there are still a basis for, under the general language of the Landerman Act, beginning to push back on that. And to say, if you don't have that funding going to an organization that's right now doing it, then I'm going to need specialized funding for you to support that within the organization. Can that be one? I have not a clue at the moment. Um, I can't say to you, yes, with certainty you're going to win it, but I also can't say with you with certainty that you're going to lose it. And so what I'm suggesting is that you become and, and begin to push back a little bit <coughs> and begin to push on some of this stuff um, because there is an appeal process. And there is stuff that can be done, and there is still some general language in it. And if you've built the case, if you've built the language into the IPP, and that this is a reasonable outcome, and this is something to be achieved, I think there's ways that you can structure it to begin to push back. Um, I don't think we should be just taking, you know, well, our service standards don't allow us to do that. Or this, the Act doesn't any longer allow us to do that. Da -da -da -da. Well. Yeah, those service standards exist, and yes, there's been limitations on what they can and can't fund. Can I get you funded for camp? Probably not. Probably I'll lose that one in nine out of ten cases. But can I get somebody funded to do something else that's consistent with an outcome that really is central to this person's development? I'm not so sure I'd lose that. So I think that it's it's a tug and pull, but we got to start and push, push back. Question. Oh. No, I, I just want to say, where do you do the pushback there, though? Because you go to a day program and they say, well, you know, we, we can't really do that because we don't have the funding for that in particular, then... But you need to know it when you're writing the IPP or you go back and say, I want to revise this IPP. Yeah, remember, you can ask for an IPP. At any time. At any time. So it's really through the IPP. Yeah. The IPP yeah. is your uh, instrument for change. And you do have a whole bunch of rights uh, when it comes to the due process. The IPP is the contract. And, uh, yes, Mr. Um, two comments. Um, 
early part of your discussion about this situation in which North LA used their administrative funds to fight a relatively trivial case. The parent board members of that organization don't understand that. I just finished a seven year term and I've gone to all the executive sessions. It's, we don't know that. So that's something. Well, that's interesting because their lawyer was sent a very long letter and asked to be shared with all of his clients, which is every member of the board, explaining why they were putting good money after bad. Let's put that aside. The other comment that I wanted to get is I had this conversation yesterday with my son's regional center contact. I haven't finished writing the IPP. I'll bring it to you when I'm done writing it so you can sign it. Anything you edit is a, is a reduction from the request. So I write the IPP and bring it to them. That's allowed. Yes. You take them a document that says, this is what I want in the IPP. If you're not going to do it, send me a formal denial and if you go to hearing with the current administrative law judges that are hearing DDS cases, you're going to win eight out of ten of those on what should be in that IPP. We have a question in the back. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to the requirement of um, families going to insurance carriers first for eligible services that are covered by insurance before regional center covers them and how maybe you could include language in the IEP that provides for stipulations because we have a lot of families that are you know one month it's insurance another month it's regional center and back and forth yeah this whole insurance mess is a mess um, I don't know the answer to I, I don't have we have a law that says for certain services that are now theoretically covered by insurance they have to go to the insurance first there has to be a way to deal with that as I sit here tonight, I have not yet um, come up with my what I feel is a uh, well thought out, sound answer to that question. I think there is one out there. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet. Are there two different types of IPPs? One for a client that lives at home with their family and one for a client that lives in a, alone in his own place. I'm asking this because I have a daughter that lives with me and I have a brother who has autism who lives on his own. And when I go to his IPP and I go to her IPP, they're different to me. It seems like because he lives on his own, they, they'll do more. But because she lives with us, it's like we're holding her back. And they figure we should do more because she lives with us, but she's 37 years old. So it almost sounds like they want us to like move her out, but she's not ready to move out. She doesn't want to do that. So it's, it's they should be the same thing, right? right? Well, they should be. They should be both be rich in content okay. and individualized. <laughs> I was going to say the same exact thing. Thank you for saying that. It depends on my daughter lives at home, and my husband and I look at the watch and say, "Okay, she rang the doorbell. Go." Anything changed? No. Okay, got her out. Bye. That's it. That's how quick it is. Each IPP. She can't be wait to leave. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah, you, you don't have to do she, that. She can't wait to leave. Yeah. She looks. My daughter lives at home, but I never have my IPP at the house. So look at this. Look at it this way. And then they don't show up to Tierra when you invite them to come. True. The IPP is a contract worth tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I'm telling you exactly what she does. She no, I. Anything change? And really, nothing really has but changed. But, but it has changed. Yeah. Yeah. So She's gotten older. Steve's Steve's notion of. You know, it's actually a good notion. Somebody ought to write something about it. I think we, we're supposed to wrap it up, but I have to, there are a few things that um, I expect from you. Okay. There's a few things that we are going to ask of you this evening. A um, couple, of, couple of phone calls and something that you can do with a pen. 
Phone calls are mandatory. The pen is something that um, I want to ask you to do. Um, I would really like it if, if each of you that have it in your heart to call your regional center counselor tomorrow. And if you're not in the middle of an angry uh, disagreement with them, basically thank them for the role that they have played in your son or daughter's life to this point and let them know that you look forward to working with them uh, collaboratively as partners as you prepare for the next year's work with them. Now the IPP might be two weeks from now or it might you might have just done it two weeks ago and you might have a year. Either way, start that relationship now on a more uh, engaged process with them. And a little bit of honey will go a long way if you start by thanking them for their role so far and then letting them know that you intend to be more involved and more engaged in that IPP um, and, and um, more engaged in the process in the year ahead. Yes. We, we, are you guys willing to do that? Yes. Okay. The second call I want you to make is, uh, I would really love it if you called your key, uh, if your son or daughter is involved in Tierra. I would really love it if you called the key staff person that plays a role in your son or daughter's life here. Um, the fact of the matter is, Tierra has outperformed its state um, budget allocation on the backs of our staff. Staff that have not had raises in I can't tell you how long. Program leaders like Gabby and, and Shannon who without complaint uh, double the size of their caseloads and, and work morning, noon, and night. And until we can pay them what they're entitled to, at least we can make sure that our families know what they're doing and that, they, and that they're appreciated and you have their backs in every way. Will you guys do that? Yeah. Okay. The third one is with the pen and that's your option. Think about writing us a check for crying out loud. <laughs> We've got to raise a million dollars a year to keep our current operations going. Honestly, the state should be paying us about three million dollars more than we get so that we would have all of the staff that we need so that we could be doing better in all the things that we're doing. We need to raise a minimum of a million bucks a year to keep the current level of services for everybody. So if you're not already a supporter, um, become a supporter. Because this is something we're all doing together. We will never quit. We will never quit working and fighting for your kids. I keep buying lottery tickets so I can give yeah. you a million. <laughs> this lady here. Actually, when somebody, in, Cal when somebody in California won last week, I wasn't in. And I saw, oh, maybe I won. And there's four charities I have that's getting the t off the top. This being one of them, and um, but then it wasn't me. <laughs> we are doing regional center work. These happen. They gave me the wrong brochures. Uh, these happen to be our brochures on educational rights, but because um, I wasn't there today and they packed me up without me looking at it, um, but it has our name and address and stuff. Those, plus some of my cards if you want to. Um, and you know, we are doing regional center work. You know, and you know she's the best. So wasn't that, wasn't that great? Let's give him another. Thank you. So I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, this is what the family ambassador uh, workshops are really all about, is educating ourselves um, so that we can go out and advocate for our sons, daughters, family members, and really uh, make a difference uh, in, the, in the world. I'm going to just leave you with a few words, and that's the first uh, two sentences of our mission statement, and that is, each and every person has value and meaning. And regardless of the notion of disability, each person has the potential to live or uh, has, oh my God, I can't even read. The potential and the right to live a productive and meaningful life. I mean, think about what you learned tonight. So the question is, every person is an individual. That's what I heard, right? Every person is an individual. You meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Um, and that every person 
every family member is moving through life and they're going to be at a different stage at life of their lives and the question is what does your IPP say is it reflective of those stages of their life are they in a period of discovery about themselves are they in a period of engagement and meaningful work are they starting to figure out that they're tired of working and need to retire back into something and what is that going to look like and does your IPP state those needs that's really important and I feel like I really learned that tonight but the last thing I feel like I learned is what role are you going to play what role are you going to play in the advocacy for your sons and daughters and in the future and the advocacy of Tiradol Soul? So I appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you very much. And I hope that you play a role and be with us and make us stronger. So thank you very much.